So yesterday I was um, driving around town here, downtown Newton. Exciting place to be, a lot goes on really. Saturday's here. Um, I've seen it before, I saw it yesterday. I, as I head north, there's um, individuals standing on the corners. You might have seen them, and they have these like these big big signs. And and so um, I'm triggered right away. I think that church from the north and the signs were hateful and hurtful. And so I get like this de- trigger defensive kind of thing. And then um, actually I know uh, w- one of the guys that was holding a sign, and uh, no longer attends here, but. Um, he was holding a sign, and so I'm like, okay, and, and I read the signs, and they were Bible verses, you know, and, and really good Bible verses, you know, believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved, and, and really good verses, and uh, I was looking at it, and I was thinking, okay, you know, that's interesting, and, and God, God can use that. He can do something with that. I don't think there's anything wrong with it, but as, as we've nav- navigated, um, uh, starting with the beginning of this year navigated through scripture, uh, we have discovered that discipleship is relational. It, it's, it's person to person. It's, it's connecting with someone. It's taking, from, uh, taking them from here and walking with them to there as we point them to Jesus every step of the way. It's a relational thing. And so, again, there's nothing wrong with the verses, and I pray God uses it. It's incredible. But I would say if we're just about holding up a verse and about doing the duty, we fall short. Discipleship is about relationship. The movement is about relationship. It's about people connecting with people, one-on-one, mess and everything. It's walking with them along the journey every step of the way. And a big part of that relationship is telling our stories to one another. The stories of God at work in our life, where he met us in the mess, and he's walking with us to future glory, where he, he saw us at the bottom, and he lifted us up out of the pit. And that is the beauty of relationship and discipleship making, is that we get to we get to tell our story, share our story, and help someone else define their story as they connect with Jesus in a relationship that's life-changing. And so this series, Redemption Stories, was purposely placed out of a very heavy sermon series, two back-to-back on biblical sexuality and abortion, on purpose, Because we want everyone to know, regardless of the decisions that you've made and are making, that redemption is available for you. That God wants to change your story and make it better. And he wants to take you from here and get you there with him for all of eternity. And it happens in a relationship. And so what's beautiful about this church is that we all have stories to share. Stories to tell. I've got a few stories that were sent in this week, and one just came in a few days ago, and I, I, I'm choosing, I'm choosing uh, to read this story this morning because it really comes off of last Sunday's message, which I think is a great segue. We're keeping these anonymous, and we encourage you to send in your stories the next few weeks so that we can um, read them, possibly read them and share them. This person writes, Hi, Pastor Chip. I'm not even sure if I would consider this a redemption story. But I wanted to share this with you either way. Last Sunday, I was able to make it to church and hear your last sermon in the abortion series. This is an issue that is and always has been so heavy on my heart and something I really prioritize with being the hands and the feet, if you will. This spring, April, May, I suffered a miscarriage. I went into my first appointment under the assumption that everything was fine. The doctor was unable to find a baby at first. When he did, the baby was much smaller than would be expected, and there was no heartbeat. It was such an agonizing experience, especially because I knew that my baby was a person with a purpose and was fearfully and wonderfully made. I knew and understood the gravity of that lost life. 
So you can see how much of your sermon last week was reaching my heart in a different way and reassuring me that all those things are true, that my baby's life did have a purpose, even if it wasn't what I wanted or expected for him or her. I can't wait to meet my baby in heaven someday. How this maybe ties into redemption is that I really believe that I will now be walking with many women through their miscarriages, which are unfortunately all too common. I was very open with a lot of people about my loss and have had several women already open up to me regarding their own miscarriages. I know this is a part of God's purpose for my, for my baby's life, even if his or her life was sadly limited to only six to eight weeks in my womb. If only all of us saw the immense value in human life. Thanks for all you do. I'm so glad I found First Baptist. That's a redemption story. That's a redemption story right there. They come in all different sizes and flavors. And, and in this particular situation, um, God wants to buy back this heartache, buy back this loss, and use it for good. And really, that's, that's the gist of redemption. It means to, to buy back, to buy back in order to set free. And so regardless of what you've experiencing and are experiencing now and will experience in the future, God wants to redeem you, your story, so that it can impact other people for good. It's terrible. It's difficult. It's hard to understand. It's hard to grasp it or get it. But God wants to redeem it and use it as we connect with one another in relationship, pointing them to Jesus. We want to encourage you, encourage you to share your stories with us and share your stories with one another. Really, it's all about the story that God is writing in your life and the lives of others that we need to share so that we can be impacted and blessed and encouraged others along on their journey. So I'll continue to pray for this, uh, this woman as she navigates this. And many of you have experienced this and are experiencing things. We pray for you that God will use your story for good as you share it with other people and how great and good God is during these difficult times. So today, I want to kick off the series. We're going to look at um, Luke chapter 15, the story of the prodigal son. I want to kick off the series today and talk to you about grace. Because without grace, redemption is impossible. Grace makes redemption possible. Grace is God's undeserved favor towards us. It, we don't deserve it. We didn't earn it. We desperately need it. And God says, I can give it, and I will give it. And he did give his grace for us. So we, as sinners, are separated from a holy, righteous God because we all sin and fall short. That sin bring God's, it brings God's wrath and punishment. But for God so loved the world that he gave Jesus so that he could buy us back from the slave market of sin and set us free to do what he's called us to do, to live out our purpose, to impact other lives, to make disciples that make disciples that make disciples, that eventually plant churches that plant churches that plant churches. It's not about the mon monument. It's all about the movement, and that starts with a relationship, all because God God took the lead, and he demonstrated his love for us. He did it, and we can accept it and do something with it. And sky is the limit when we begin to have this relationship focused, all based upon God's grace towards us. I'm going to look at Luke 15 this morning, and we're going to get to verse 30, or 30, yeah, we will, but we're going to get to verse 11 in a moment, but I... I want to start off with verses 1 and 2. Luke 15, 1 and 2, we read that the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. Tax collectors, they, they were not very popular. They worked for the government, they collected money for the government, but they also took whatever they wanted on top, and they were well-to-do, and, and people... Um, they felt abused by them, misled by them, mistreated by them, and so tax collectors were hated. So in this scenario here, you have these tax collectors and sinners. Some translations 
and other gospels refer to them as notorious sinners, the worst of the worst, they were all gathering around to hear Jesus. Okay, now, that sounds like a good situation to me. You got the worst of the worst around the best guy in the room, the best guy on the planet, Jesus himself, who is God. They're listening to Jesus. Like, I would hope we would look at that and be like, whew, they sure do need Jesus. Wow, that's awesome. I pray that they'll believe. I pray that they'll be saved. I pray that they'll change their life. Like, we look at this, I read this, I'm thinking, this is great. This is incredible. Verse 2, but, here comes some Debbie Downers. There's always going to be Debbie Downers that aren't happy with what's going on. It's not happening their way, when they want it, how they want it, with who they want it with. But, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, right, these are like the righteous people. I will say this, they are the self-righteous people. So you have the unrighteous meeting with Jesus, and you have the self-righteous meeting with Jesus. Regardless, if you're unrighteous or self-righteous, we all need to meet with Jesus. And he meets with everybody. That's what I love about Jesus. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they muttered, barely audible, but you've got to remember this. Jesus hears everything. He's God. And they mumbled to themselves and they muttered to themselves that this man, Jesus, welcomes sinners and he eats with them. So they took a really good thing and, to, and they made it a, a, a bad thing. They were self-righteous. They're like, they don't deserve Jesus. They don't deserve this. What's he doing meeting with them? And they were trying to disqualify Jesus as the Son of God and the Messiah. And, and they had things against Jesus. And, they turned, and this is one of the things they did. They turned a great thing into a really bad thing. So then Jesus, he hears everything. He told some parables. He told some stories with a very deep meaning. And so he told the one where the, uh, the, the shepherd loses the sheep. And he goes out and and finds it, looks for the one. He tells about the lost coin, the parable of the lost coin. And then we get in verse 11, the parable of the lost son, also known as the parable of the prodigal son. And that's what I want to focus on this morning. I, I, I want you to read it with me this morning as we look at each verse and we unpack what grace is all about. Because you're, you're going to find yourself in the story whether you're the, you're the unrighteous or you're the self-righteous. We're going to find ourselves. And we need to remember here that, that the father in the story represents God, our loving, caring father, and his approach towards all of us. And this is about our sin and what God wants to do with us as a result of our disobedience towards him and his approach towards us, his grace and his mercy that he wants to pour into our lives. In verse 11, Jesus continued. He gets to the third parable, and he says that there was a man who had two sons. So the parable is going to be about the two sons. Which one are you? The younger one, the younger son, said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. Now, I want to stop there. What the son said, it was legal. It was okay. He can say it. Nothing wrong with it. But it wasn't very loving. It's as if he was saying, I wish you were already dead because all I want is your money. I mean, he didn't say that, but he was kind of saying that. So it was legal, but not loving. What did the father do? The father divided his property between them. That's it. Okay. That's what you want. That's what you get. So he did it. Just like that. Here you go. You want it? You're going to get it. Here it is. Verse 13. Not long after that, I underline that in my Bible, because to me it says he didn't, he didn't care about his father at all. He just wanted the money. 
So not long after that, you know, right away, he gets the money, it's in his hands. The younger son got together all that he had, he got it all together, and he set off for a distant country. And there, he squandered his wealth in wild living. He just did whatever he wanted to do with ever, whoever he wanted to do it with. He got what he wanted, and he was doing what he wanted. You know, he went away to, to find his life, but later we'll find out that he really lost his life. He thought he had everything he needed, but he really didn't. He squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country. So he had nothing, and he had nobody, and he began to be in need. So what did he do? He went and he hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed, pig, to feed pigs. He longed, this guy was so hungry, this younger son was so hungry, he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating. But no one gave him anything. He was that desperate. He hit bottom. He had everything. Now he has nothing. And that's, that's the story of many of us, where we, we long for happiness, and so we try to purchase it, buy it, get it, receive it. Once we get it and, and we lose it, we're, we're just lost. We call that hitting bottom. He hit bottom. In verse 17, there's some good news here. And really, the gospel is all about good news. You know, it starts with bad news, our position before God because of our sin. We squander everything. We run from him. But there's good news. There's always hope. There's always a chance. In verse 17, when he, this younger son, came to his senses, when he came to his senses, it kind of all hit him. He hit bottom, and he kind of woke up one day. And many of you, part of your story is that you've, you came to your senses. We call that the Holy Spirit working in your life. The Holy Spirit is hovering over you, working in you and through you and through other people to wake you up and will sometimes use your difficult situations and circumstances to get you where He needs you to be. And now, but it's our decision on how we're going to handle that. And some of you here today, you've come to your senses. And some of you here today, you need to come to your senses. And I pray that you'll do that this morning. For some reason, God brought you here today, and I pray that you'd come to your senses. That God, the Holy Spirit, would overwhelm you with his love, grace, and mercy, and that you'd realize you can't do it without him. You're trying, and you can do so much, you'll never, you'll never make it. You'll one day and hit bottom and realize that you need him desperately. When he came to his senses, he said this, and he said it to himself, because there's like nobody around. He has nobody, the pigs. I guess he said it to the pigs. He said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am. I'm starving to death. So I'm going to set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. So make me like one of your hired servants. In verse 20, I circled the word so. So he got up and he went to his father. It's one thing to come to your senses and have a plan. It's another thing to execute that plan. It's called repentance. You change your mind about what's going on, but you do something about it. It's one thing to think, I messed up, I made mistakes. But if you do nothing about it, you don't turn from your way and turn back to God's way, that's not true like repentance. And so this younger son, he had a great idea. He came to his sentence, sen senses, but he got up and he went to his father. He had to make a decision and he did it. He turned from his sin and now he's turning towards his father. So what's going to happen? But why, I love this part of the story. But while he was still a long way off. His father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. 
So this father, this wealthy father, is in a position where he is, he is looking for his son to return back home. So that when he catches a glimpse, he runs towards him. That is a beautiful picture of God. When we start coming towards God, we make that decision. He runs to us, holds us, loves us, receives us. What's that called? It's called grace. He could have called out, he could have called out the guards. Arrest him. He could, have, he could have put up a barrier and said, no way. But he was looking out for him and he ran to him. There's a song, a Christian song made popular way back in the day. I listened to it twice in this morning when I was in the shower. And uh, through you know, the Alexa, play this song. It's called When God Ran by um, Benny, uh, Benny Hester. A powerful song about this story. And it just stirred up all kinds of emotions because that's what God does when he sees us in our condition and and we come to our senses, he runs to us. That's what grace does. That's what God did and will do for you. Did you deserve it? No. But you need it and God wants to provide it. And he can. No matter what you're experiencing, no matter what you're going through right now, no matter what you're using or clicking on, whoever you're sleeping with, or whatever's going on right now, God wants to take you where you're at, love you and accept you, and, 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 and really walk with you where you need to be. And he, he's desperate for us and wants us to come back in that relationship. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and then kissed him. So then the son said to him, so the son is now making a confession. He's confessing his sins. You know, we read towards believers in 1 John uh, 1, 9. If you confess your sins, God is faithful and just will forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. He confesses. He's, he said, the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. I'm no longer. So I'm not looking to be a son. I'm looking to be a servant. But before he could talk anymore, he was interrupted by his father. The father would not allow him to finish his sentence. The one that said, that he said to himself with the pigs, like, make me like one of your hired servants. He couldn't tell the father that. The father wouldn't let him say it. The father interrupted him right there and said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe, probably his, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet, and bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost, but now he's found. So they began to celebrate. What's interesting is, is that the younger son expected to be a servant, but God says, no, you are my son. He came back to servanthood, but the father brought him back to sonship. Because he's part of the family. That's grace, undeserved favor. That's a redemption story. And that is a part of our story if we've accepted Jesus as our Savior. And even as a believer, if you've wandered off, you can come back and he's there and he wants to have fellowship with you. So whether it's forgiveness of sins for eternal life or forgiveness of sins for the believer as for the abundant life, God's grace is sufficient and available to all of us at any time. He says, you're coming back as a son. Meanwhile, let's bring in the older son. Meanwhile, the older son, the self-righteous, he was in the field. And when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. Oh, what's going on? A little party going on? So he called one of his servants, and he asked him, what was going on? Hey, what's going on over there? The servant said that your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. So what's the older brother going to do? What's the older brother going to say? Like, I hope we would be like, what? That's incredible. That's amazing. That's awesome. Let's go party. Let's go celebrate. This is amazing. But no. The older brother became angry. He was angry. 
kind of reminds me of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law when Jesus was meeting with the tax collectors and the notorious sinners. Same type of deal. The older brother became angry and he refused to go in. I'm not going in. I'm not going to party. I'm not going to celebrate that. So what did the father do? So his father went out to him and pleaded with him. That's what I love about God. He's available to the unrighteous, the self-righteous. It doesn't matter. So he went out to this older son who did everything right. And he pleaded with him. And he met him with where he was at and tried to say, come on in. Come on in and celebrate. Pleaded with him. But the older son answered his father and said, look, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. Today we would say like, you know, uh, um, a Tesla or something like that. But young goats back then, I guess that was a thing. So uh, you didn't give me that young goat or anything so I could celebrate with my friends. None of that. But when this son of yours, not even my brother, not even my brother, he didn't, he didn't call him brother. When this son of yours, he's your son. When, when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes, when he comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. You, you pull out the best for him. You gave him the best even though he did the worst. And here I am doing all the right things and I didn't get a go. My son, the father said, you're always with me. You're always with me. And everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate. We had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now he is, he's found. That, my friends, is the story, the redemption story of grace where God pours his love on the one who didn't deserve it and offers him this opportunity to be a part of the family and have fellowship with the father. But yet there's always the other son and the question is, which one are we? We're all in the unrighteous category, even the self-righteous, but how are we gonna respond to grace and deal with grace? I wanna summarize this powerful passage this morning with three statements. The first statement is this. Number one, I want to say this. I want to say the fact that grace is for everyone. Grace is for everyone. There's no exemptions. It's for you, no matter what you've done, no matter what you are doing or will ever do. Grace is for you. Grace is for family members that have mistreated you. Grace is for the one that has abused you. Grace is for the people in prison. Grace is for your coworkers that are terrible and they're underhanded and they seem to be getting away with it. Grace is for people on the political spectrum that we disagree with in a very strong way. Grace is also for them. Grace is for everyone. There's no exemptions. It was for you and now it's also for those that God is bringing to your life. Grace is for everyone. Grace isn't freedom to keep on sinning, but grace says, I'm going to accept you where you're at and love you where you need to be. And sometimes grace allows people to suffer the consequences of their sin so that they can get closer to God. So in this story, the father doesn't bail out the son. He lost everything. We, we don't know what happened at the end. He made him a son, but at the end of the day, he lost all his money. He had to experience. He didn't kind of go out and rescue him. The son had to, on his own, had to kind of come back, come to his senses. But grace is for everyone. So who are the people in your life that need God's grace so that they can be overwhelmed and impacted? Number two, I want to say this. Grace is transformational. Grace is transformational. When we truly understand God's grace, his undeserved favor that's been poured into our life, if you truly grasp it, get it, then you'll be transformed by it. It will change the way you live. 
You know, I'm testimony, Pastor Eric is testimony, and almost all of you are a testimony to that fact on how God took us where we were at. We ran from him, we walked away from him, and yet he brought us back, and it changed our life. It's transformational. And I, I gotta tell you, I never wanna go back to a legalistic lifestyle again because I was transformed from that to a life of grace. And yeah, it's hard to give it towards someone who didn't earn it or deserve it, but then I quickly remember that I was transformed by it and out of it so I can do something with it and share it. And that's incredible. So it's for everyone. It's transformational. And the third thing I simply want to say is this. It's overwhelming. Overwhelming. Grace will change your life. Understanding it, applying it, will change your life. It will change the way you live, the way you act, the way you respond towards people, the way you approach your marriage and your kids, the way you approach the people at work. It's overwhelming. And if it doesn't bring you to tears at times, I will say you just don't understand it or get it. And I pray that you will be transformed by it. I want to invite the worship team to the stage. I want to invite the elders to their positions because today, a, a really nice wrap-up of this sermon will point us to the Lord's table. The Lord's table is a picture of redemption. It's a picture of God seeing our, our need for a Savior, seeing our need to be set free from our sins, and He did something about it. Jesus came to earth, he walked amongst the people, and he connected with so many people, as we see here this morning, and he changed so many lives. Before he sacrificed his life on the cross, which is kind of represented in the story of the fattened calf, the sacrifice that was given for the younger son, the young righteous, for all of us, Jesus, he is that sacrifice. God sent him, and Jesus accepted that call, and he willingly, obediently gave his life and sacrificed his life on the cross and paid for all of our sins. And before Jesus went to that cross, he set up the Lord's table with his close followers that was to be followed through every church gathering of people, gathering of believers that were to follow this example of a time to remember the body of Jesus and the blood of Jesus that was sacrificed in our half, on our behalf. And it is a picture of redemption where God buys us black, back from the slave market of sin through the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And we take the bread and we take the cup to trigger in us this overwhelming feeling, this transformational feeling that will motivate us to continue to do what he's called us to do. So this table is very important because it represents the story of our redemption. In a moment, the elders are going to serve you. It's the two for one. The cup and the bread will be together. You kind of hold them, kind of separate them. And, and don't take them yet. Hold on to them. And you can worship God through confession. You can worship him through singing. You can worship him through prayer or silence or whatever you want to do. And, and I would say if you have sin or have issues that you just confess them, admit them, and run back to him, and he'll run and meet you there and take you where you need to be, and that you would just connect with God during this moment. And when we're all served, we will take the elements together. Let me just say a prayer. Father, I thank you for the bread and the cup. Lord, I thank you what they represent and the power that comes behind them, the life transformation, Lord, that is represented here today. May we never forget what you went through on our behalf, how you sacrificed your life for us so now that we have a redemption story, Lord, and we were, we were lost, but now we're found. We were lost, but now we can see all because of what you've done. We're thankful. We're grateful. And so, Lord, as we hold these elements in a moment, May you transform us, overwhelm us with your undeserved favor, your grace that would change the way we think, change the way we speak, change the way we live and function each and every day. So we commit it to you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.